and it was time for us to go on. And when we came down and we were standing in our on position, we were at the sides of the stage and Brian May walks up and gives us the most unbelievable introduction. And we didn't really know until we were going on what he was going to say. And he went on and he said, these guys are real friends Uh, and more than any other group on this planet the guys that understand what Queen have been about all these years and what Freddie's been about all these years. And and then he went on to use our individual names and and, and say, please welcome Paul, Pat, Nuno, Gary, Extreme. And the place lights up. And I got to tell you, at that point, we were playing in arenas and stadiums four nights a week. And it was like having breakfast. It was like we're doing it every fucking day. Now I was fucking nervous. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you're sitting down and I ask you to please breathe in through your nose. Now count to three, two, one. Now out through your mouth. Three. This is so uncomfortable. This is too zen for you. Now remember, remember, the whomping noise is the nitrous. Womp, 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 womp. Welcome to 2020. I am Benny Goodman. (laughs) And also huffing nitrous with me are my cohorts in crime, as Siobhan has dubbed me as saying, which is probably a thing that I talk about because I say, here's the thing, and then it's never a thing. It's multiple things. It's hyperbole, as she's actually also dubbed it. Siobhan Cronin. Yo. <laughs> and then we have Corey Peza. Oh, that was, that was really just a glowing introduction. <laughs> I refrain from any base speak. I appreciate that very much. So this week we have, honestly, a guy that's so ridiculously incredible and integral to the music industry as a backbone to a drummer of a multi-platinum band to the manager behind some of literally the biggest people in the world, from Joe Perry of Aerosmith to Johnny Depp, like the guy from Pirates of the Caribbean, that guy. Um, He has been uh, working with the new kids on the block and the Backstreet Boys to the Smashing Pumpkins. It's kind of crazy. To, to Irving Azoff, who helped make the Eagles. The guy is literally a walking chronology of music history. And let me tell you. And his name is? Paul Geary. <laughs> literally will give you the chronology because if you go chronologically, like by the time codes on this episode, you will hear sequentially because he stops my train of thought from going everywhere like a Pulp Fiction movie like Quentin Tarantino is like pretty much going fuck you like you're not going to get it ever (laughs) this is the unofficial but incredibly detailed autobiography uh, narrated by himself Paul Geary and he leaves no stone unturned in all of these stories I mean literally from start to finish every detail everything every thought process it's a really jam-packed episode with like everything you would want to hear about this this history Yeah, so check it out. This is part one with Paul Geary. Start this. Are you ready to go, Paul? Ready. All right, can you count us off, though? Count you off. One, two, (laughs) one, two, fuck you, go. All right, we're here in 2020. I'm Benny Goodman with my cohorts in crime virtually and literally assaulting you in the eardrum range. Uh, First and foremost, ranging in at about 40 to 100 hertz, we have Corey Peza. I get get to go first this time? (laughs) (laughs) Only because we, we want... We want to we want to continue to internalize that Siobhan should go first so that when she introduces herself, that she also introduces herself first because she's a lady. And that said, (laughs) she's a lady. Siobhan Cronin. Hello. And then I know you guys are all waiting for the waiting for the punchline, which I already fucked up. And he counted us in one of my favorite people on this planet. One of my best friends. One of my biggest influences as far as musically, and certainly a guy I have learned so much from in this music industry. Give it up for the legendary Paul Geary. Woo! Woo. That's where you got to <laughs> Insert Foley sound here. Yeah, we'll, we'll put some applause in there. 
Paul, how are you? I couldn't be better. <clears throat> that was a great answer. That's yeah. great. You're so positive. Most people are like, fuck this year. I hate it. <laughs> Today sucks. <laughs> yeah. Well, it looks like there's a light at the end of the tunnel here. And I, I think we all kind of knew, uh, you know, what was going to happen eventually. And it seems like it's working its way through now. But it's all good here. Yeah. Well, so what? No, well, go ahead, I was going to say one of my favorite things for 2020, what, when I first realized that maybe there was a silver lining in this giant shit storm was um, the first, one of the first people I had, I had seen uh, when everyone had gone into lockdown was Paul. He flew in, <laughs> had to deal with some, uh, some business stuff, and um, he was like, Benny, the beginning of the year. Godsmack, who he manages, by the way, just a little band from Boston, unlike uh, many other little bands, maybe like Aerosmith or Extreme or the band Boston from Boston, all of whom Paul is friends with. But Godsmack had a giant stadium tour set for this year. Do you know how that went? Not so good. Yeah, but Paul other- still had a smile on his face. And what did you tell me, Paul? What did I tell you then? Then why things? I'm sure things have changed, but then. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, look, I, this has been tremendously tough on everybody. I, I mean, early in the year around that time, I, who knew? I mean, I, I'll never forget. It was Friday the 13th, actually. It's March, Friday the 13th, when we all heard oh, God. You know, that, yeah. that, that, you know, you got to let your employees go home. <laughs> And we all sat around going, what does that mean? You know, like, and, and uh, for months, you know, this went on for a while, you know, once we all went home and everybody thought, oh, okay, well, whatever this is about, you know, after a month or, or more, you know, we'll get, we had to figure it out and we'll get back to it. Um, clearly we all know today, but at the time, uh, who knew that, you know, I remember hearing people say, oh no, this is going to go on till June or even July. And, and thinking, oh, my God, like, how are we going to hold up a company with employees and offices and, uh, and, and all those uh, platinum records behind you? <clears throat> yeah, well, uh, there wouldn't be much many, many more of those if this shit keeps up. But, you know, um, we all had to go home. And after a couple months, I frankly, I could no longer hold up um, everyone's payroll and offices and all we tried as long as we could until every tour was canceled for the rest of the year. And there was no discernible earnings that would, you know, justify that. And uh, so look at, it all went south, but you know, we're all resilient as people and as hard as it may be, especially for people who, you know, the restaurant business, any form of public gathering uh, business, you know, that, got shut down. It's brutal because there, as we all know, the ripple effect, and it's not just the person that owns the restaurant, it's all the employees. And then it's all the vendors and the truck drivers and the delivery services. And it falls right down. And so many people, I, I, frank, I don't even know how people have held up all this time. Um, other than, you know, someone, you know, like myself or people who had a little bit of an nest egg, they can sort of see their way through the whole thing. But like, um, it's just amazing what's going on there on a broader level. And I'm so happy to see that, uh, I guess Friday, they're going to have the second, uh, company that's delivering now on a, on a vaccine. So, you know, we have some scheduled tours for next year. Uh, the first one, uh, is a major arena tour in Europe, in the UK in August and September. And I have high hopes that that's actually going to fly now, given all this. <laughs> Wow, but, that's amazing. But, but, what, but what happened? See, here's this. This is the thing. When I talked to you, none of these tours were even a, a, a thought anymore. It was all the kibosh to everything. Everyone was like literally in bunkers. You were the first person I had seen outside in my house in a long time. You and John Garabedian. And we maintained social distance. And it was like, are we allowed to do this? And all of that. But you said that your year had started off terrible with that, but then got oh, yeah. back. What, what you're referring to is some, some major deals that went down almost as a result of the fact that COVID, um, when, when that hit and all the bands realized that um, they weren't going to be able to tour for who knows how long. And for some people, you know, I mean, for Godsmack even, you know, that's how they make their living and they have overheads and they got to keep up with that. 
And it well, let and, and hold on, back. let's let's pause for a moment. And you have all when you're doing giant, you know, giant tours, you have a whole crew of people. You have a sound engineer, you have yeah. a monitor guy, you have people who are doing your merch, you have well, all your crew, your bus drivers. And, they're all relying on vendors. you. Oh yeah, lights, sound, vendors, all that, all that shit. Uh, which was, you know, but the but the main focus for myself in that case is is the act because that's my responsibility is to manage the act. And in that case, you know, the interesting thing about COVID, it create it created some creativity because everybody had to get at the table and say, okay, what do we do? You know, and that led actually to making some creative deals that you were referring to that um, changed the whole year for all of us. Um, and, and that was just a matter of moving toward what, what assets do we have? And then you move away from touring and into publishing and uh, masters that maybe you have some ownership of and so forth. So a lot of deals ended up going down because of COVID and to hold people over and some pretty major deals went down as, as a result of that. It's interesting as we all see how businesses were all crushed, other businesses were actually helped by it. We saw how streaming went through the roof and, you know, Netflix doing better than ever. And, you know, other, you know, Disney plus coming up and Hulu and all the rest of them that we're accustomed to watching all those stocks went through the roof. And there's so many others. Uh, Amazon, delivery services, food, all, all that just went up so high that that created opportunity in itself. Uh, and so for us, um, owning streaming rights, that's where you would go. Okay, now our streaming rights are suddenly so much more valuable than they, than they were before COVID hit that maybe it's time to do some deals in that direction. So and, did, uh, did Sully ever walk into an office and say to you like, you know what, can't we just like, do this in people's living room through their stereos and make money like without having to do any of that. And like, no, not really. people God smack. I'm just kidding. Uh, I don't know. With God smack, they were at the end of their two year gigantic run coming off of when legends rise album. And uh, they were going down for a break anyway, to make a new record. So that worked out perfectly, but just, you know, getting back to what you were saying, you know, as far as I can go is to say that there were opportunities for selling streaming and masters and so forth. And that, that uh, sort of set everybody up to weather this uh, nicely. And so for me personally, it turned into a great year um, monetarily. Um, but for so many people, that's just not the case. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's kind of crazy how uh, an event like this can really tilt the scale one way or the other. The, the three of us, obviously, we created this podcast because of everything that's going on. And we're all well, fortunate that, that we essentially live in studios and don't go outside anyways, you know, even before everything happened. So it didn't affect us as much as it could have affected some other people. Siobhan, obviously, was in the middle of Russia uh, on tour and had to... Because she's a rock star. <laughs> yeah, she, she actually leaves the, uh, the studio every now and, and then. And by the but... way, just as a side note, Paul, I don't know if you're aware of this. Have you seen the show The Queen's Gambit? You know, I just started watching it last night. It's a good show, right? It looked great. I saw one. Okay, no, hold on, but, but pay attention now because you're going to be much more interested. So Siobhan calls me like, you know, because Netflix says you should watch the show. It's popular. It's blah, 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 blah. And I had seen the show, The Queen's Gambit, and I'm like, not interested. And then Siobhan calls me and goes, yeah, one of my friends, like he uh, composed stuff for like a Netflix show. Um, it's called The Queen's Gambit. And I play pretty much, um, well, the solo violin, like a lot of the, vi a lot of the violin is me. And I'm like, what? And then I go, and I said, you know what, Siobhan, I bet you now my sidebar had heard her. And then I said, I bet you it's going to be number one on TV by the weekend. And she's like, what? what? Wow. And I go, and next time I signed on to Netflix, it was number one on Netflix. <laughs> and I called Siobhan. I said, Siobhan, your show's number one. And she first, first thing she says is what? <laughs> and I'm like, your show. What I show? just finished watching it like a couple days ago. So yeah. I was like the last person to watch it. But, but what did if you, think? I, oh, it's incredible. I mean, it's funny because like, you know, I, I knew the composer and had worked with him. He's done other Netflix series before. And he called me to record some of the stems like almost two years ago, I think. Maybe oh. it was a year. But, you know, at the time he was like, oh, yeah, it's going to maybe be this show about chess. And like I saw some of the like, you know, he'd had the screen with all of the like clips, but it hadn't been like fully edited yet. And then I didn't hear anything about it. And then I'm like, wait, 
is this the same chess show that he was talking about? And then he calls me. He's like, yeah, you're in the credits on the Queen's Gambit. And he like sent me a screenshot and all this oh, stuff. So great. I, yeah, it was it was oh. really cool. So I didn't realize it would be such a big hit. But I mean, it's great that it is. Yeah. yeah. So I'm, Siobhan's I'm, well, now a, a Netflix star, too. Yeah. yeah so right. Now, now I'm more excited to watch. <laughs> so, yeah, listen, listen for the music. You know, it's, see if you like it's it. also exceptionally good music. So, like, it's one of those things where you watch the show, the music actually we were talking to Steve Stevens and he kind of said the same thing. Like it, it, um, it, you take a moment and you go, wow, that music is actually very cool. And it's, it's atmospheric and it really adds to the characters. The the show. Yeah. yeah. Well, but you'll watch it because it'll just pull you in like cocaine. <laughs> like Netflix the- wants it to be, you know, while. this you've sat in those rooms. How do we make this like crystal meth? Call it breaking bad. Oh my gosh. Well, anyway, so Paul, back to you though. So you've already mentioned a lot of super interesting things. And for the people that don't know who you are, you work in artist management, you have a company, but you also started out as a musician, which is really interesting to me because, you know, as someone that's in a band, I meet a lot of like label people and managers, and a lot of them have always just been on the corporate side. So maybe you could kind of tell some of the listeners or viewers how you got started. Uh, You were in the band Extreme, maybe talk about, you know, the trajectory from being a band guy, how you left. Maybe just some of your backstory. Sure. Well, the funny thing is, for me, I'm very surprised that it doesn't happen more often. Like, I kind of kind of see, well, you learn so much. One learns so much um, being in a band about all the rest. Like, for instance, for myself, I grew up, I, I was born in Medford. And, um, you know, I, I grew up there and, you know, in the 70s when I was a teenager and, Aerosmith and Led Zeppelin and and Pink Floyd, they were all putting out current records, you know, like new records. And I remember back then being so enamored with I mean, back then in the the, every week, uh, a record we know today to be a classic you know, was coming out. It would be uh, Dark Side of the Moon. And, and a week later, you know, Aerosmith Rocks would come out. And, you know, a week later, you know, Led Zeppelin, you know, live, you know, came out of or, or the Led Zeppelin movie. And, like looking back on it today, it's like, oh, my God, what a prolific period of time. With we, we could all probably go on and on with the classic rock. And I was out of my mind about it. And it was really Aerosmith. I would say that um, because they were a Boston band and because they were, you know, the baddest ass guys, you know, like back back then and what what they were doing, I was so enamored with it that I uh, I managed to, you know, we we were poor like like most people were back then, but uh, you know, my mom did manage to get me a set of drums and um, I was I just played, you know, I'm dating myself, but. You know, my parents had like one of those turntables that was inside your TV. It was like a console thing yes. where your TV was there and you open the top up and there was a console with a, you know. So I would play these albums and desperately play it as loud as it could and desperately try and keep up with it on the drums, like many musicians start. And uh, I was just so passionate that I think it saved my life because otherwise, I mean, I, I dropped out of high school to join a band. You know, and that could have been a complete and utter disaster, you know, but uh, what saved me and what I'll say is that I knew what I wanted and that was it. I I was doing that, you know, and, you know, many people feel that way, uh, you know, artists. And I, I find that it's almost invariable, you know, the artists that actually go further and get further are the ones that are most passionate and most committed. And I certainly was that as a young guy. Anyway, you know, forming bands locally with friends in the neighborhood garages and doing all that. I, I was, um, I'd say, 18 or so when uh, I was rehearsing with my a couple friends in my garage. We were playing cover songs, you know, and, and Gary Sharon walked in the garage. He knocked on the door and he was a neighbor from a block over. Um, and uh, he told me he wanted to be a singer and he sings at home and he wants to do this. And, and so I invited him in and before you know it, you know, he and I were playing together, um, playing Aerosmith songs and, you know, all Led Zeppelin and whatever we could do. And funny enough, him and I, uh, we were inseparable 
through my whole process, you know, through, through us being in that band to, you know, finding more serious players and eventually, you know, forming a better band and now playing in clubs and getting a little bit better at, Oh, well now you have to be, you know, present presentation and, and, uh, you know, we wrote so many terrible songs, you know, because it, it takes writing about, you know, a hundred songs to get to just a couple of great ones, you sure. know, and you just keep going and going and going until you have, you know, enough to make a really good record. And, and, you know, for us, that's what happened. And uh, I'll tell you an interesting story is the first like little break we got, <clears throat> we were called the dream. That was the name of our band. And we were playing from, you know, 1981 to about 1984 in clubs under that name. And what happened at the time, it, it was really strange because we were getting a little bit of momentum and starting to draw crowds locally. Um, and one day, uh, uh, the, a, a woman who worked for us back then, I should credit her, her with this, as she noticed in back then you had TV guides to tell you what was on TV, was like this little thing that came to your house, this little like paperback thing. And it was showing all the new season shows. And at the time, um, it showed uh, a new sitcom on CBS called Dreams, starring you know, a brand new young star named John Stamos. Uh, and we were going, wow, that's really weird. That's dreams. It's just like our thing. And it's a band trying to make it. It's a garage band trying to get off the ground. It's all just oh, like wow. us, you know? And <clears throat> well, we noticed that. <clears throat> and, you know, uh, a minute later, um, <sighs> trying to remember what went down here. We, we, you know, we, we started to think about the, um, if our trademark would hold up or any, anything like that. And we hired a lawyer and a call came in and it came into the hotline. Like we used to have a call set up so people could call and find out where we were playing. And it was an attorney and he, the attorney wanted to offer us $5,000 for the name, the dream, because he represented a band. Um, he said that, that, uh, wanted to use the name and had been using the name. Um, and we said, well, you know, we, we have been doing pretty well with it. We're making a couple grand a week and, you know, in 82 or three or whatever that was, that for yeah. us, was great. You know, we would, Dude, we, that's more money than Corey and I have ever made. <laughs> <laughs> well, we were, we were all still living at home, you know, and it was like beer money and all that. And so anyway, we turned it down and the guy calls back and he offered 10 grand. And he calls back and he offers 15 grand. And now we're starting to go, what? What's wow. going on here? Like, why? Just find another name. I mean, it's not that, that much. And, you know, that that's actually when the TV guide came, thing came out because we had called them out on it and said, hey, maybe we both have a problem here because, you know, this show. John Stamos. Came, is definitely not yeah. the dream we're talking about. <laughs> Even though many yeah. women across the world probably disagree that he was the dream. But well, well, we'll see now because what went on is the 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 woman who was working with us that ha had saw the TV guy in the first place. Um, we all got together with her on it, and we hired an attorney to get to the bottom of our mark and all that. And when the guy <clears throat> called. And the attorney called him out on it. He said, okay, look, I work for CBS. I've been contracted by CBS to clean this stuff up. And uh, we want to buy the trademark. We think it's easier that way because otherwise we still think we can use it, but we will have to, if that's the case, uh, you know, file because you guys would have to prove that you were using it in interstate commerce, not just Massachusetts. It had to be in a bunch of states for us to hold on to it. But it turned out we did have that because we were playing in Rhode Island. We were playing in New Hampshire and we were selling T-shirts. It was enough to hold up. To make a long story longer, <laughs> what happened was they they agreed. We asked for $100,000. God bless you, Paul Gary. Which to us 
a hundred grand may have been a hundred million, you know, like uh, one hundred million big, dollars. Well, yeah, right. Pick yeah. us up. So, so we asked for a hundred grand, and the guy said, "Well, look, for a hundred grand, again, this is eighty-two or something. Uh, for a hundred grand, it's probably worth us fighting it. But what we will give you is this: we'll write you a check for twenty-five thousand bucks right now, and we'll give you five hundred bucks for every episode." Every time an episode runs, we give you 500 bucks. And if it goes into syndication, you get that too. So, you know, it would be exponential, like it, all the networks that would play it. Also. So we agreed to it. We sold the name, The Dream. We, we took the dough, you know, we, we, we made some recordings and we started moving forward and we, would, we needed a new name. So while we're sitting at the drawing board trying to decide what name we would be using, you know, um, we no decided idea. to write these these what people do when they when they play in clubs and flyers and so forth. And, and we said, OK, we're going to put formally the dream, you know, such and such a name, formally the dream. And then we started saying, well, X dream, we're we're X dream, you know, and they they said and we, so we were going to go with X dream. And they said, no, you can't use dream in your name. It can't happen. So we came back with, well, what about extreme? We went to our lawyer because that's not extreme. That's another word. It's extreme. And the way the thing was worded, they couldn't stop that. So we became extreme um, as a result of that. The TV show came out and it stiffed. It was John Stamos' like debut, and a couple of episodes ran, or however many ran a season, maybe not even. But in, and they they pulled it, but that was that, and that's how we became extreme. And at that point, we were getting more serious about the act, and we, our guitar player, we he resigned, and we hired Nuno at that point and you know was very young you know i mean this isn't he yeah. still really young <clears throat> i guess compared to the rest of us well i mean he is he looks ageless like literally he looks exactly the same like if you yeah, see him because like, this is him for <laughs> 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 we're like for like for 30 years like and and, and not just that <laughs> he sent a, a birthday message to our mutual friend scott and i'm not trying to get too deep or whatever but he he has he wore like a patriots hat like with with the Hat up, and the first thing is Cindy, who's also a Portuguese, my fiance, walks into the room. She goes, "Wow, he's even hot with a hat." I'm like, "He's <laughs> fucking seventy! <laughs> Fuck that guy!" Yeah, that's funny, right? Yeah, he was always the that guy in the band. You well, know? you're the drummer, man, so we know, we know, we know how that hierarchy works for real. Yeah. Well, look, at the end of the day, I got Gene. <laughs> yeah, you did win. We we actually know the end of this story that you you got one of our favorite people. We haven't gotten there yet, though. Well, yeah, like so. Go on with your story. So you okay? You, so that's the first part. That's the first big chapter of the book. That's how we became extreme. And at that point, we had a little bit of money to to uh, start really recording in the studio with that money we had. This way, that's a, the whole next level. Is how do we take what these songs that we've written and create a, a sonic, a sound, like, because that's a, the next step, you know, like to, to, that's a whole different thing, you know, and we're all local guys. And uh, I think we had an engineer that Nuno was friendly with, and he came in and helped us. And we just kept recording and recording and recording. And, and uh, we finally, that led to um, an introduction to some people who owned a studio and they were in love with our act. And what they decided was, well, look, you guys can record for free in the middle of the night. So all day our studios rented, you know, that's when we rented people come in in the daytime and record, but when they, you know, load out or whatever, you could start at midnight. So, you know, we play from midnight till like, you know, seven, eight in the morning and we'd record, record, record until we came out with a vast, you know, 50, 60 songs, you know, recorded well enough to, you know, get a pretty good idea of what it was. And that led to having like five really great songs. And we began to send those out. And uh, <clears throat> record companies were sniffing around. And in, in November of 1987, uh, <clears throat> a rep from A&M Records walked into the uh, was the Paradise Theater on Calm Ave. 
And it was sold out to the gill. And they came in. And at that point, we had real momentum going regionally. And uh, we had made a video with some of the money. We submitted it to MTV. And, you know, that was actually before that. How about V66? Did you put it on V66? Well, that came a little. Yeah, that did come after we won a round of this, what they call the MTV basement tapes back then, which was a big deal because our video was played on MTV. And mm-hmm. all that momentum helped all that what was going on. And then a Records signed us in uh, November of 87. Uh, and that was the click into my my and all of our professional lives, you know. And it was in March of 89. We finally put out our first album. And we had originally, we were such big fans of Queen. And when asked, who would you like to get to produce your record? I think Gary or Nuno, one of them was thought, well, we want Mac, the guy who recorded those Queen albums that we love so much. So they reached out to him um, and he flew over from England and uh, he actually recorded, you know, the first album with us, which was wonderful because we sat around just talking about Freddie and Queen all day long because he spent. Any good stories just out of curiosity, because you're talking about Reinhold Mac who is, uh, uh, he did like the works record. Um, he did a lot. He did the eighties queen. Yeah. Yes. All right. He, and he also, if you remember Billy, um, you know, was that guy? Lonely is the Billy night. Ocean. No, that wasn't Billy. It was Billy Ocean. Um, I'm on, uh, it was that solo artist guy. Billy that, Squire. And, Billy Squire. Right. And he had a, he had a bunch of hits at that time with Mac. You know, they were recording that. Those are but good tunes. Again, we decided those sounds weren't really right for extreme. So we finished that album and, and moved on, but the album came out um, in March of 89. And uh, you know, we toured uh, extensively uh, cause back then when you were signed to a record company, you know, they supported rock bands. So they underwrote the tours. We were able to tour in Japan and all across Europe and America. And they were good with it because they, you know, they, they saw, uh, the possibilities for us. And the first record so- stalled at about uh, maybe 300,000 copies. And it, it, you know, that's remember when that sucked. <clears throat> yeah. That wasn't good back then. We, we were hoping to be at least gold. Um, and, at least. you know, today that'd be a lot of records, but back then it wasn't. So <clears throat> what happened was we, we went back to the drawing board to make our second record. And by that time, we had been on the road extensively and we got so much more proficient as players and we spent so much more time together in hotel rooms around the world and sound checks in the buildings and all and being able to get it together, which really was the, the impetus of um, Pornographia, our second album. Um, and that record, funny enough, when that came out in uh, 1990, we followed right up the following year, sometime later. I think it was September of 1990. Um, the record came out with the first single, and it did pretty well. And the second single came out, which was a song called Get the Funk Out, which we thought, you know, to this day, I, I look at that song as sort of, if I had to pick one song that says, that would epitomize what we were trying to do as a funk rock funky rock band that was it i mean it had that that bass groove and you know the guitar solo was insane the 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 chorus was hooky like the whole thing really really worked for us and at first it was a minor hit it got to number 10 um in the top 10 um at rock radio got to number 10 our record reached three hundred thousand copies and started tanking at that point it was off the chart again and we were like wow we we, we were hoping to have a gain on this Get album the fuck just, out of here <laughs> yeah exactly just a bit more than 300 we just wanted growth you know so get the funk out happened to be so more successful in europe it was actually a dance club thing people were digging it we did a remix and like we went over to europe um at that time and while we were touring there on the back of Get the Funk Out, the record company had called us. And, you know, I think it was just before we left, actually, before we left for Europe. They, they called us and said, look, the song Get the Funk Out, I mean, more than words. It's getting played on a Midwestern radio station. And people are calling for it. And the radio station, everybody seems to think this is it. It's not what you guys do normally. It's a, an acoustic ballad. But, like, 
it's really working. Should we, do you want to go with it? Hold on a second, but have the Goo Goo Dolls taught you nothing back in the 80s before that band (laughs) happened? (laughs) I guess not. I wasn't paying attention. But to, to to their credit, the record companies... The record company at the time, a and they gave us the option. They didn't push anything on us. They said, you know, you could either come back and and we'll stick with it and we'll make a third record. Or we could release this track and, and see what we can do with it while you guys are off in Europe. And we we were like, well, look, you know, it's, it's our song. We like the song. Let's, OK, go ahead. So they released it. <clears throat> we left for Europe to record, record to a tour on Get the Funk Out. And by about three or four weeks into that extensive tour, we were getting blow up phone calls that like radio was picking it up like crazy all over the place. And not just rock radio, it began to cross over to top 40 radio. I mean, you guys would know like Kiss 108 in Boston started playing it. And then suddenly it was a runaway hit. And by the time we got back um, from Europe, we were coming back to a whole different America because by that now we, we had a a substantial hit record that was still growing. And I, I want to say, actually it was just before we came back to U S the U S because we were in Scotland at the time we were in with, with uh, Anne Marie Cronin. <laughs> That's where my family's from. Ah, uh, Oh really? Yeah. Were you in Glasgow, <laughs> Edinburgh? No, we were actually in um, Sherwood forest. Okay. Is that, was it was, there was Maybe. a, there was a hotel and I remember seeing Sherwood or Sherwood Forest or, whatever, or nearby that. And uh, but we got the call every week. You know, I was on the phone with our manager at the time and getting the lowdown and the so were you like the band manager within the band at the time. Cause like you, well, I was that from the beginning. Okay. Yeah. From, from the time we were in garage because nobody cared, mm-hmm. you know, you, you have to do it yourself, you know? Um, but by the time we had a record deal and we began to tour, then we went to New York to meet a manager. At least, at least I did. Maybe we all went out and we hired a guy um, to be, to who knew what he was doing because I was still a bit green. I mean, I knew what I was trying to do, but there was a lot about publishing and records and, deals that I didn't know. I was still learning. And, but the guys generally to their credit, they just trusted me to make all those decisions where we grew into that kind of machine where like Nuno would write the, the riffs and the arrangements and then Gary would write the lyrics. And that's just the way it was. Everybody had their lane, you know? So, and no one wanted to do the other. I mean, I couldn't, I wasn't a writer to begin with. Um, Gary wasn't an instrumentalist, but he was a great poet and he just wrote lyrics and wrote clever lyrics. And, and Nuno wasn't a lyricist or at least not at the time and didn't want to know anything about what I was doing. Like, so they just trusted me to do that and it worked out perfectly. And that's why we, I credit where, why we became what we became. Anyway, back to Scotland, I was on the phone with our manager and he was jumping up and I all excited. You have the number one song in the country, you know, so I, I, you know, it was like hotel, like phones back then. You went to your phone to make a room, a call from the room, you know, and I remember I couldn't get downstairs to the bar fast enough where everybody (laughs) was um, and all like we cheered we you know we couldn't believe it because when we left i don't even think we were on the chart uh, you know like and we came back we the song was you know a gigantic hit and we were on mtv you know we made the video i think before we left by the time we got back it was you know the so the timeline gets a little bit shaky in my mind because we're talking about you know 25 years ago or whatever it was but the the video was then getting played wasn't at, it like, like 30 years ago well this was on nine 1991 yeah 20 because i i actually remember i think it was almost five years ago the 25 the year anniversary oh, yeah. and seeing Makes you know sense. eat the tw- i had some of that cake and that was like a long time ago shows you yeah. shows you how fast sunrise sunset <laughs> yeah so I didn't mean to, uh, to derail you, That's but right. I just wanted to give oh. us a good co- chronology because it, it <laughs> yeah, actually yeah. has been even longer than that. And you yeah, look great. So, so, one. 
So what it was was 87 record deal, 89 first album, 91 first hit. And it was a doozy fucking hit. I mean, because the song, you know, was number one. By the time it got done, it was number one in 30 countries. And at that time, we began to sell 120,000 albums a week. Remember, we had sold 300,000 total of our first record. Now we were selling 120,000 copies a week. And that didn't stop for about a year. I mean, we were just out there now touring how many records has Porter graffiti Papa. sold paul total you know i don't know about today at the time we clipped about four million at the time that um we stopped sort of paying close attention because you got to remember when that record came out it was no sound scan oh that's right it's before the nielsen sound scan era, yeah that's so. Cool. so you the record company basically would tell you you know what retail what you See, did what you did is actually sold 20 million records. And then Don Arden came in and said, hey, <laughs> yeah. you guys just did good. You sold four million, oh, four and a half million, four and a half million records. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, there was a lot of shenanigans back there. There's no question about it. But for us, it wasn't about that anyway. Like we were now connected with the people and we were touring like every cycle we would hit you know, somewhere around 30 countries or 32 wow. countries. And uh, it was the wildest thing to get off a plane in South America and Argentina and having a crowd at the airport, like waiting for you to come through. And you'd have to be, there were times like in Brazil where they had to take us from customs one at a time to our tour bus, because once they opened the custom doors, the people were there and they'd have to surround one guy, you know, with security and then you'd move through the crowd like that, put him on the bus, come back, get the next guy and bring us through. It was the wildest thing because we had gone from, you know, Med one of those bands where, <laughs> you know, people maybe heard of you, but not so much. And, and then, but at that point, everyone knew us and everybody knew that song. Well, hold on. Can, I, I do want to put an ellipsis in this because I, I want to say something. Sure. Who thought of getting a trademark for Dream? I was because just going to say that. That, that was that so that forward thinking. The whole, the whole time, I'm sitting there to myself like, we fucked up, Paul. With my own brother, we couldn't get the name Sinfinity. <laughs> when we had Scott involved, like hundreds of thousands of dollars. And yet, like, he, he filed for, like, Ice Skating Troop or something like that on, for a trademark. <laughs> and meanwhile, you and Nuno are fucking 2020-ing in 1985 John Stamos because you filed for a trademark and you did it properly. Can we please talk well, about this? Well, this was pre-Nuno, wasn't it? Oh, was this yeah. before? Yeah. Yeah. That's right. He wasn't in uh, the band. Yeah, no, no but was, I was going to comment on the same thing. Yeah, that was incredibly forward thinking. Yeah, I mean, for a young person. Nuno was never in the dream. Um, we were, the, in fact, extreme for about, I'm going to guess, a year uh, before Nuno joined the band. And another side note, in the height of the dream's career, before we we flipped and all that happened, we played, we opened for Night Ranger, we, who at the time had this hit called Sister Christian. Sister which was, Christian. Yeah, that was, that was a number one hit. And we, we opened for them at the Orpheum. It was the first time we ever saw like a seated audience with a, you know, like a concert proper rather than playing in the, albeit the bigger nightclubs, we were playing in clubs, you know. Um, and that was in 1984. And that was a different band. That was the dream with me and Gary and three other guys. Um, and it was about uh, two years later in uh, eight. No, it was 85 that Nuno joined. And then in 86, Pat joined. And in 87, we got signed. That was the sort of chron chronology of all that. <clears throat> wow. So it was uh, your idea to get the trademark, like when you first no, started the dream? No, no. I, it, back then... Gary started out, or you know, I mean, he was always this, but he was a great artist. So he would draw all these sort of trade, not trademarks, but well, they became trademarks. But the, oh, you like know, a logo, logos, or, uh, yeah, all these logos yeah. and images and and all that. And um, I gotta say that Joanne Cody, the girl who um, worked with me mostly, but she was uh, the band's. Uh, manager per se because we, I mean while I was personally booking the gigs and 
making sure the trucks showed up on, you know, we used to uh, rent U-Haul trucks and, you know, cause even as a local band, we took ourselves very seriously. So like, you know, in the arenas back then, they used to have these platforms and stuff on stage, these metal, like we would build them out of wood um, and put them in trucks and show up at the clubs and actually have like platforms and risers that we just did it ourselves because to us, we would just like experience, we were an arena band playing clubs and we wanted to present ourselves that way. So that's what we did. It's like and my band very much. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> a lot you of know, production. Yeah. Anyway, I'm sorry. Go ahead. That's yeah, incredible. No, Cause you, you need to present yourself how you want other people to see you, you know, like, um, and at the time we saw ourselves as an arena band. So we just like made ourselves be an arena band playing in clubs. So, you know, we, we buy these things and we, we not buy them, we build them and come and, and put them up. And so we'd rent the U-Haul truck and we get that shit in there and we'd spend all our money, you know, doing that and keep enough money aside to pay for our rehearsal room and for us all to get like McDonald's or Burger King, whatever at the rehearsal room. So we could eat and play None of us had jobs and that's what we did full time. It was a lot of fun offshoot stories to that too. Cause our rehearsal space was in Cambridge. And at the time Boston would rehearse in there, Aerosmith, the cars. And I, I remember just Who? stopping to, to the band next door and it would be the cars playing their first album and stuff in there. And I remember doing shit like poking a hole through the wall when they weren't there and I'd come back and we'd be, through watching the cars play some of these songs and to to me i i it was like wow these guys are real deal they're like they had hit records you know and occasionally you'd see aerosmith roll in and boston was there often and we started that's where everyone went back then you know um but i'm getting off off um were you ever like track- in the bathroom like in like rick ocasek was like washing his hands Dude, it's funny you say that. (laughs) It's funny you say that. I was at the stall and uh, not Ben or the keyboard player. Greg Greg Hawks. Greg Hawks, who I'm friendly with, actually. Sorry, Greg. I shouldn't. Um, Anyway, he walked in and I remember being a real short guy, you know, like and uh, not that I'm a tall guy either, but uh, he came in and I was just almost speechless i'm going wow that's a that's that guy you know like the, those you know because they were so keyboard heavy you know and all, all all the things that they did back then and i i remember being in awe of all those guys and i remember leaving rehearsal when the cars were still in there and i saw a jaguar outside and i saw a cassette tape that said the car is written in like magic marker on the tape. And it was in the passenger seat with some lyric sheets sitting on the passenger seat with the, with a cassette in there. And I went, man, that's Rick, that's Rick Ocasek's car. And, and that's so fucking cool. You know, you still have the um, lyrics. <clears throat> ah, I, I should have stolen them. Uh, yeah. Dude, you really should have. That would have been a way cooler story. Yeah, no, but you hooligan. You know, I, but the, the story really is that for me, I was that in awe, you know, like of every of everything, of all of it. And that's, you know, an important part of getting where you're going is that passion and that awe, you know. But so fast forward, we're in 91 now, big hit record, 92, we're touring in Europe, we're playing at this point in, in big venues, we're playing in arenas. And while we were over there, uh, the guys were always talking about Queen in the press. Well, uh, Brian May showed up um, and we were in awe meeting Brian and he knew the band. He was he was into it. We asked him to sit in and we played in London um, at the, the big theater, the uh, Hammersmith Odeon. And we were there for two nights. It's a 5,000 capacity venue. We were in there for two nights and Brian showed up and we played um, for an encore. We played uh, tie your mother down and Brian played guitar. And I, I was playing behind him going, Oh my God, 
oh my God, I'm playing Queen music with Brian and he's in the front playing and the crowd went wild and we really bonded so wait a with minute. him. And- Were you guys like the original Foo Fighters? Because that's just exactly what Dave Grohl did. And he acted like he was the first ever to do that. And that was so cool. But really, oh. it was extreme <laughs> saying, hey, welcome Brian May to the stage in his hometown at the Hammersmith Odeon. I'm, I'm just messing with you. But I just think to my, in fact, I will tell one story that will bring it back to this. So uh. you played the Freddie Mercury tribute concert. And well, that comes next. That's a year later. So should I wait? wait. Yeah, let him let him continue with his story. I'll wait till your love comes yeah. down. Well, at that point, we were really hoping to meet Freddie, you know, and we kept saying to Brian, bring Fred out. Come on, bring Freddie out. Both of you guys come out. And and, uh, you know, it was after it was during that period of time that uh, we got the word. Um, and he kept saying, well, he's not feeling well. He's you know, saying that nobody told us what was going on, but you know, he died. Okay. And when we came back to London, I think we were, for whatever reason we were coming. Um, oh, I remember we were playing at Wembley stadium with, with Brian Adams. When Brian Adams had that hit everything I do, I do it for you. We had more than words. It was like that we both, they were both gigantic hits. They were like the number one and the number two worldwide played songs that year. So we played at the stadium. It was, you know, 95,000 people, you know. And once we came there, um, we, we played and the next, thing that put us in awe happened in that we met Roger Daltrey and when we played played at the stadium, our encore was two Who songs and Roger fronted the band and we we played um, a song called 515 and... uh, I don't remember the uh, it was there were two who songs anyway. It was a wild I hope thing. One, one. I just want to interject and say I hope one day I forget memories as cool <laughs> as playing with Roger Daltrey on stage. You know what? I don't even remember. What do we Bob O'Reilly? <laughs> I don't know. Was it Won't Get Fooled Again? I don't even remember. <laughs> uh, Freddie Mercury couldn't make it though. It didn't matter. We could have been playing, you know, the Mickey Mouse Club hit <laughs> song or whatever. I was with Rod, he was swinging that mic you know, 20 feet in the air and doing the things he was doing. And it was just a trip. And anyway, I believe, again, I'm lousy with the chronology. So there's so many years ago, but Brian had, um, Freddie died. Brian had invited us to dinner and we were in London and we show up to meet him for dinner and he brings John Deacon and Roger Taylor. So the four of us are sitting with the three queen guys having dinner. And that in itself was already, we're having dinner with queen. Sick. <laughs> you know, like, so we're at the table talking and, you know, of course, Freddie had died recently and the whole thing. And that's when they asked us if we would represent queen and play at Wembley stadium uh, because they were going to plan a huge send off for Freddie at Wembley stadium. And that they didn't have it all together, didn't know who was going to be there, but they were absolutely sure that they wanted us to come in and and play with them. And I got to tell you, it was it was uh, breathtaking, fucking breathtaking. I mean, because, you know, we'd grown up on Queen and here they are like not only have, have we played with Brian and now like he's inviting us to do this. Um, Did it make up for the fact that Freddie didn't come out to your shows? That who didn't? That Freddie couldn't make it out to your shows because Brian was making excuses? Well, um, well, nothing could make up for the loss of Freddie, but... Right answer, Paul. Right answer. But I will tell you that um, it was such an honor, and uh, as you guys have probably seen, I know you have seen, but like, you know, we we played at Wembley Stadium um, and it was it was broadcast live in 80 countries on MTV. Um, and we played to a billion people, oh 95,000 people in house and Metallica went on before us. 
and they were on the blackout. A lot, of, a lot of people were really mad about that, by the way. I love that because I, I actually saw in their box set, they had a whole heckle to you guys, like where it showed that Extreme was on later. And, and like, I, <laughs> as a Metallica fan, I was like, oh, that didn't make sense. You know, but now I'm like, oh, that's so much cooler. <laughs> well, it made sense after the show. It didn't make sense before. It, well, yeah, you know? no shit. I mean, well, it, you guys stole the show. It was interesting because the three of the Metallica guys uh, were in Florida when we were recording an album before we played that show. And they came over my apartment because they were just in town. And so James Hatfield just shows up at your house. Like it was, it was, it was uh, Kirk James and um, Lars. And, you know, they, I think I was talking to Lars or whatever it may have been on the phone. And he goes, yeah, we're here too. We, you know, let's go out and do something, you know, let's have some drinks or whatever. So they came over to meet us and we started to hang around. And we were, I don't know what we were doing, fucking around in, in the kitchen of this little apartment. And, but Hetfield, you know, at the time wasn't as open and friendly with us. I don't know. Maybe he, I don't know what. So he, he's sitting in the living room and I was sitting at the table and Lars started heckling going, Hey, what the fuck is this in London? You guys are going on after us. And <laughs> Uh, how, how'd you fucking do that? And uh, I remember saying, I don't know, man. They just called us and told us when we're on. <clears throat> you know, I, I, you know, it's nothing we did. It's just, you know, what what happened? And he said, okay, well, good luck, man. And huh. I, I remember going, oh, fuck, yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I don't wow. know, you know. And they were in the, I mean, this was the height of the Black Album. They were gigantic, you know, and... <clears throat> We had now had three hits be in the in Europe, in UK particularly, because Get the Funk Out actually happened over there in a way it didn't happen here. And then More Than Words came out and was, you know, gigantic and put us on the top of the pops and fucking playing those shows like there and, and you know, their version of the Grammys and, you know, going over and doing all that fucking shit and playing live. And then we followed up with the song Wholehearted, which was also a giant hit there. And we were just off giant pop hits. So we were on the BBC, like, Radio One and and shit that, you know, even Metallica at the time was not on, uh, even though they were still a more gigantic band worldwide. And Lars be- is sitting at home having one of his servants go, <laughs> well, you just wait, Mr. Gary. You'll see. You'll see. Oh, well, they did show us because it, there's still a fucking stadium act and, you know, we're not. So anyway, we went out together that night, I remember, because and Hetfield... I remember he didn't really know the band very well. And I remember him like really paying attention to Nuno's playing and trying to figure out what he was all about. But anyway, we get to London, we're backstage. I have some of this on videotape. It's kind of fun. We're, and now suddenly Brian gives us a lecture that like, not a lecture, but a, like a talking to of like, look, we don't have enough dressing rooms in Wembley stadium for like, everyone to be satisfied because the star power was ridiculous. And so we said, can, we, can, we, can we drop the names? Because I don't, Siobhan, like, just out of curiosity, okay, do you know, do you it know was, this? I'm familiar was, with yeah. it. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Well in the room, in this very large dressing room area that had offshoot rooms, we had in that room, Elton John, David Bowie, George Michael, Queen, Metallica, Guns N' Roses, Def Leppard, Extreme. Um, I mean, and now you get Whoa, into the wait, Roger Daltrey. You had Liza Minnelli, Roger, Minnell, Roger Minnell, Plant, Elizabeth Taylor, Guns N' Roses. Like, yeah, he I said, said that. Guns. Yeah, okay. holy shit. But but you know the single seal, stars. Seal. Like, it was ridiculous. It was it was everyone you could imagine, and we were like out of our minds that we were in the in the midst of all that. Place. Tony Iommi, had, Black Sabbath. We forgot Black that's Sabbath. Right. Fucking hell. yeah. Well, look, I'm sure there's five of them right now I could bring up that you're probably forgetting. Um, what the status quo? Oh no! Well, Annie Lennox was there. David Annie Bowie. Lennox. David Bowie and Annie Lennox did Bowie. under pressure, which was unbelievable. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, it was a huge, huge event. And while we were rehearsing for it, we realized, because here's where the, the magic happened. Brian May, 
he said to each of the four bands, there were four basic bands and everybody else would join in Queen or interacting somehow. There was no other bands. It was Metallica, Extreme, Def Leppard and Guns N' Roses. Those were the four basic bands that, that played. And what he did was he sent everyone, everyone else's set list because he didn't want us all to play the same Queen songs. Because if we were going to play a Queen song in our set, we, he wanted us to pick a different song because each, everybody was going to play one Queen song, you know, amongst their own set. <clears throat> so once we got it and we realized, oh, my God, so Metallica is only playing one and it's um, <clears throat> Stone Cold Crazy. It's not really a vocal song and not really a traditional Queen song, really. I mean, you know, what you think about Queen with the big vocals? Stone Cold Crazy, you know? Yeah, exactly. Which worked out for them. <laughs> and Def Leppard was playing one. I think it was, you know, Will Rocky or something, whatever they decided to play. Basic. And Guns N' Roses. <clears throat> you know, there was no Queen, really. And we were going, oh, my God. And the light bulb went off. And Gary and Nuno, I want to say, came up. <clears throat> with this medley idea and we hammered it out that we were going to do the career of queen in 25 minutes, you know? So the idea was I'm going to take clips, 30 seconds of, of each song, 20 seconds of this one, 30 seconds of that one. And we were going to somehow make it work because all the, the tempos were different <clears throat> and we had to somehow smooth it so that it would come up and down where it needed to. You didn't have your pro uh, tools with your click track being piped <laughs> in. No, you really couldn't use a click track to that because it was too all over the place. I did use click tracks at the time. I mean, when you're in stadiums, the, the blowback is so big sure, yeah. and all, you know, that you, you really need to be as a drummer. You I use in-ear monitors, Paul. I wouldn't, I don't use that heathen shit. Yeah. Well, that, <laughs> they hadn't been invented yet, dude. <laughs> you know, I've never played a stadium. All right, Ben, let him finish his story. Oh my gosh, it's so interesting. No, keep going. So, okay, so <clears throat> we decided to do this medley and we get there and now the the energy is palpable. This is unbelievable. The whole world's there. Those MTV, all major news networks. You couldn't come out of the dressing rooms of that era without being converged on by the press. Um, <clears throat> and... I remember even outside the music celebrities, like the Cindy Crawford walks up with a microphone and it's like, Cindy Crawford, what the fuck? You know, she was like, you know, the biggest supermodel of the day, you know, the cover of every, you know, magazine you could imagine, you know, she was it. <clears throat> and so here we are, we're up there. The day goes by, Metallica's going on. Um, there's some other funny stories that we can talk about offline one of these days. If, um, you know, if Siobhan, you're, you're ever around maybe Ernie's or something, yeah. you know, I'll, I'll tell you some, some of the really fun stuff. And, um, but anyway, Metallica plays, the crowd goes wild. They're playing the black album songs and they played the one queen song <clears throat> and it was time for us to go on. <clears throat> and when we came down and we were standing in our on position, we were at the sides of the stage and Brian May walks up and gives us the most unbelievable introduction. And we didn't really know until we were going on what he was going to say. And he went on and he said, these guys are real friends and more than any other group on this planet, the guys that understand what Queen had been about all these years and what Freddie's been about all these years. And, and then he went on to use our individual names and, and, and say, please welcome Paul, Pat, Nuno, Gary, Extreme. And the place lights up. And I got to tell you, I, at that point, we were playing in arenas and stadiums four nights a week. And it was like having breakfast. It was like we we're doing it every fucking day. Now I was fucking nervous. I was walking out onto that stage with the, coming at you know with that many people and the cameras and the you know because it was this concert was being viewed bigger than live aid it was a billion people because live aid didn't have the technology at the time to reach what 
we were reaching at that point. And the nerve wracking part is that we weren't playing our own music. We were playing queen music and we would. The, the Queen's fans. And, and yeah. Right. And the, the three members of queen are on the side of the stage watching us. No big deal. <clears throat> right. It was uh, not to mention the other people just coming down to see what it was all about. You know, like. Uh, Bowie talking to Ellen John going, Hey, that drummer is kind of cute. <clears throat> it, dude. It was just the craziest thing ever. So please, um, either Siobhan have, have been show you this, this clip. I mean, it's all recorded. You can see this. It's, it's really well filmed and you can see the whole thing on YouTube. Um, but we come out on stage, we started the set, the people lit up and we had probably the best set of our lives. We were just dead on. And I think it was because we were so intent on it being dead on. And we were so, you know, you didn't want to be the guy in that band that let the other three down. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you that much, you know, not now. I mean, this was something if you were, you made, if anything went wrong, you were going to be ridiculed. You know what I mean? Because we were playing queen and queen of beloved, you know, and it's so easy to be picked on, you know, like when, when you're trying to play someone else's music, especially we're playing Queen in London right after Freddie's death, yeah. you know, so no pressure. it was such a Jesus. trip. And then we went off and you, you'll see it in the film. Like when it, when it's over, it was like, wow, wow, wow. We knew that something really historical had just went down and we walked off. It was the like stage. queen getting off live aid. Everyone knew that they stole the show. When I, <laughs> you, I've watched all eight hours or whatever of this show. And there is no question in my mind. Cause you see the lineup and like, look, Ro Roger Daltrey with T Tony Omi, really cool. Like everyone's awesome. I mean, there's some real highlights where you have like Annie Lennox and David Bowie doing under yeah. pressure. And you have obviously historically George Michael, uh, rest in peace doing somebody to love but you guys did a 14 minute medley or something like that and people were moving and uh, it, it gave me flashbacks i watched it actually as it happened um but it gave me flashbacks of queen in 86 wembley stadium because that queen had a certain audience where they moved a certain way and gary yeah, yeah. and you guys were able to elicit that and one of the coolest moments of my life was when we were at a birthday party for our friend Ernie Bach, and we're 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 sitting with uh, most of the guys from Extreme, and someone had said, uh, "Let's put on the Freddie Mercury show," and my fiance had never seen it, um, and we're we're all sitting there, and, and I'm watching you, watch yourself, yeah. play <laughs> oh my the God, craziest that's so show crazy. ever, wow. and I'm sitting there the whole time like talking to Cindy going, do you know how cool this is? Like, are you aware of how awesome this is? And that we're in the room with these guys and Gary looked the same other than he had like maybe a little bit more hair going, you know, like yeah. he, he looks the same. He moves the same. He probably wears the exact same clothes. No, well, he takes care of himself. You, you guys know, all like do. You guys all look ridiculously like Nuno has been cryogenically frozen <laughs> since 93. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> That's funny. Well, I got a deal. So, Siobhan, I'm going to watch Queen's Gamut and listen to the music, and you're going to check out the Queen medley. Yes. Oh, my God. No, this I literally was, like, choking up and tearing up when you said that was, like, such a story. I just don't even know how to react. That's, like, what a great way to end the first episode. Because, because it's at that time. So, I'm going to say, first off, thank you so much, Paul Geary, for, for not only illuminating us, but... Freddie Mercury and Queen is my all time. I mean, I have my signed Freddie Mercury record behind me, which is my I my, pri my prized right. possession, right? But you <laughs> are as close to what actually happened, and you guys stole the show at the Queen show playing Queen. And for me, it, you can't Queen's Gambit anybody better than Extreme. So with that, you've been twenty twenty. <laughs> Paul, stick around, please. Hey, thanks, man. Rebel Yell had been, we cut the track, and then our producer, Keith Forsey, said, you know, we need something at the front to let people know the cavalry's coming, rather than just, bam, here it is. And uh -huh. I said, oh, I've got this little intro thing. I've, I've had that intro thing for years. And I said, let me, you know, let me just tag it on the front, and that's exactly what happened. So wow. um, those are sometimes those little afterthoughts that become, become really cool, you know?